every time I hear that song, I hearken back to being in Chicago. I don't know if anybody here has ever visited Pacific Garden Mission. It's a homeless shelter in Chicago. It's where they record the Unshackled radio show. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, but they have a service in the evening, um, and they always sing Victory in Jesus. And these men who come from the inner city who have been saved from just, just what they would probably testify as, you know, the, the difficulties of life, the drunkenness and, and that sort of thing, and the joy that they have in their salvation as they sing that. Victory in Jesus. By the way, you don't have to have come out of drunkenness and alcoholism and, and substance abuse to understand that joy, right? <laughs> I mean, we, we aren't all as depraved as we could be, but we're all as depraved as we need to be, right? I mean, we all fall short, and uh, we have victory in Jesus Christ. Amen. A number of years ago when we attended a different church, uh, there was a deacon there who would be called upon to pray. And he had, I don't have a deep voice, but this guy had a deep voice. And he would come forward, he'd look out at the crowd before he prayed, and he'd say, I'll try. Prepare yourself to pray. And then he'd bow his head and he'd pray. <laughs> and, and anytime he was called up, you, you could expect that, you know. And I thought about that as I looked at our text that we're going to be in the next few weeks, verses 15 through 23 of Ephesians 1. For those of you who aren't aware, we're working through the book of Ephesians, and I plan to continue until either Jesus takes us home, or, um, or and that might be before we get done with this series, but, uh, or, or until we're done with the book. <laughs> but I thought about this as Paul prepares to pray in verses 15 through 23. He begins in verses 15 through 16. And what, what kind of posture do we take when we pray? Uh, I've been working a good news club for the last, I think, three, three Tuesdays, right? We've been working, my family and a few others here from church have been working at the Norton Elementary School and Good News Club. They had too many kids, which is a great problem to have. And so since Tawny, our secretary, since she works there, she said, hey, would you guys want to put a team together? And so Tawny kind of put a team together from our church and, um, and brought us in. And now we do Good News Club uh, with the first and second graders at Norton Elementary School. And um, when, I, when I start the, start the uh, club, I usually ask them, I, you know, I mean, let's, let's pray. And I always tell them, you know, what do I tell them? Close your eyes, right? Bow your heads and fold your hands. That's how I was taught to pray when I was, that's the posture of prayer. <laughs> you know, there's nothing biblical about that. <laughs> but, but we do that to try to keep from distractions, right? And, and I was the kid, if you didn't have me close my eyes, I'd be touching my neighbor. And, you know, I mean, so fold the hands because... I was that boy, all right? And so for those of you with a, with a son who has ADHD, I'll just tell you, you know, there's hope, okay? Or I'm sorry you're looking at your future son, adult son, and I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but when we tell people, get ready to pray, pray, what, what you know, I mean, we look in the Bible. In, in Ephesians, actually, Paul later on is going to say he bows his knee to the Father. He takes that posture. But we can think of Nehemiah. He's, he's in the, the court serving as the cupbearer to the king. And the cupbearer says, why are you so downcast, Nehemiah? And he says, and I prayed. Now, I don't think Nehemiah folded his hands, bowed his head, and closed his eyes in front of the king. <laughs> right? He just went, help me, Lord, in his spirit. Right? And that was his posture. And, there, and there's various places where people raise their hands to the Lord in prayer. But we're Baptists. We don't do that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, still okay. The Bible still says, you know, it actually, side note, it, says, it commands us to raise our hands, just so you know. So, um, some of you need to start obeying. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> but what posture do we take to pray? What is the posture of prayer? And I believe Paul is approaching this prayer he talks about that he prays for the church. He's approaching that prayer and giving us an idea of the posture of prayer. And so let's look at verses 15 through 16. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16 is where we'll be this morning. Is this is the, I told you before, the verses 3 through 14, the original Greek, we believe are one sentence. Well, guess what? 15 through 23, again, one sentence. So your whole chapter 1 is two sentences in the original language, you know. So a lot of run on here. Now, in my Bible, in, in the ESV anyway, the translation, 
it is one sentence here. Now, 3 through 14 is not, but mine doesn't have any periods in 15 through 23. Yours may or may not. I didn't look at every translation, but uh, either way, follow along in whatever God has placed, whatever translation God's placed in your hands this morning. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So he begins to, to prepare, so to speak, them to hear what he's praying for them. And, and, and I want us to, to take out of this today and the next coming weeks is how we can pray for one another. Because if Paul prays this way for the church in Ephesus, then we ought to pray this way for one another. Right? Say yes. Yes. Okay, you're right. That's fine. You know, amen. We ought to do the same. He sets an example for us, doesn't he? And so we can pray for one another because of our blessing from the Lord. Because of our blessing from the Lord. How does he start? He says in verse 15, for this reason. For what reason? I mean, somebody says for this reason, because of this, well, because of what? We should ask that question. When you go to the text, you should always be asking questions. Okay? So when you read your Bible, ask questions. And then go look for answers, okay? And there are answers that, that answer that. So for this reason, what reason? Verses 3 through 14. Let's just look at verse 3 because that's, that's a summary of it all. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. For that reason. Because we are blessed with every spiritual blessing, we can pray for one another. Because we are blessed with every spiritual blessing. Everyone who is in Christ. Right? Amen. Amen. If you are in Christ, you have these blessings. For that reason, we can pray for one another because God has blessed us. You know, we don't even have access to the throne room unless God has blessed us with these spiritual blessings. We can't go to God. If we, were, if we could, we'd be cut off and dead, Right? I mean, with unholy people, we need to be made holy and blameless through Jesus Christ so that we can go into the throne room and, and pray. And so we can't even go to God on other people's behalf if we have not been blessed with these spiritual blessings. But then he goes on and he, he kind of explains um, a little bit or expounds a little bit on these blessings as though he has not said enough, but why, do, why does this church, why do these people have these blessings? For this reason... Because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus. Our blessing coincides with faith in the Lord Jesus. I say, and I use the word coincides because some people want to talk about the order of salvation. You know, I have faith, then I receive the blessings. But if we were to go to Ephesians 2.8, it says, For by grace you have been saved. Have you been saved by God's grace? Amen. Yes. And by grace and by grace alone, you have been saved if you are in Christ today. It's only by His grace. You say, but pastor, it says more. Yes, it does. It says, through faith, <laughs> right? And so you say, well, yeah, so we have to work up the faith. No. <laughs> Let's look at Ephesians 2, 2, 8. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. <laughs> well, that's pretty clear. This isn't something you did. You've been saved by grace. Yes, God's grace. You've been saved by grace. So it's not your doing. Who did? God did. Right? Who did the doing? God did the doing, not me. It's not of your own doing. It's the gift of God. And, and what is the gift of God? The faith that you possess is the gift of God. So when God blesses you with every spiritual blessing, He blesses you with the faith to believe in Him. He blesses you with the faith to believe in Him. He gave you that. He gifted that to you as part of the blessing. So here's the deal. You, you cannot have every spiritual blessing, you can have any spiritual blessing from God unless you have faith, Correct? Unless you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you also cannot have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and not be blessed with every spiritual blessing. Right? They must come together. They come together. They coincide. Right? 
And, and God gives us the ability to exercise faith at all in Him. It's a blessing of God. That's why it's all of grace. It's all of grace. It's God's grace that I am going to heaven. It's God's grace that I'm being transformed. It's by God's grace that I am who I am today. I was sharing with our Sunday school class, and I said, uh, every failure is mine. Every success is his. Every success is his grace, right? Everything I do well, that's by his grace. Oh, I own all the failures. <laughs> he owns everything I've done well because it's his doing in my life. And we're going to come back to this, but um, let's move on for a moment here because our blessing also coincides with love toward all the saints. Here he says, I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. Your blessing coincides with love toward all the saints. Now, we always think of faith and, and that being given to us at the moment of salvation, right? 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 Okay. Did you know that love for all the saints is also a gift from God? Love for all the saints. 1 John 4, 19-21 says this, We love because He first loved us. <laughs> That's the only way we love, is because He first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. John doesn't miss words here, does he? I mean, he's like, he's just a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother or sister or her sister or her brother, right? Amen. Must love. The love for all the saints is also a gift of God out of the salvation that he gifts us with, the grace that he gives us. It gives us a love for all the saints. You know, we'll talk about it in a moment a little bit more deeply, but what did Jesus say? You'll know you're my disciples by your love for one another. The church loves each other. Amen? Amen. Some of you are looking around going, well, <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> right? <laughs> Maybe this section, you know. <laughs> this might be a convicting sermon this morning. It is for me. Out of this what is Paul doing here as he shares with them what he has heard about the church? What is he doing? He's encouraging the church, isn't he? If someone came and visited Norton Baptist Church and they stood up front and they said, Norton Baptist Church, I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and I have heard of your love for one another, for all the saints, we would be encouraged by that, wouldn't we? Let me just practice this this morning. I see the faith in the Lord Jesus in, 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 in this church. I see it. I see it exercised. I, I, when we came and visited, you know, nearly two years ago, and we did a picnic to, to introduce us to the church and the church to be introduced to us, we left knowing the love of all the saints was here at Norton Baptist Church. Because you didn't know us. Now, it's kind of like cheating because you were interviewing me to be a pastor. <laughs> so it's kind of like cheating, like you're going to maybe give us some special attention. But I knew the love was all, all I could see it. Because it wasn't just the way you interacted with my wife and me and my daughters. It was, it was the way you interacted with one another. And I could see love here. Now, Paul is, does not say here, your love is complete. In fact, further on, he's going to encourage the church at Ephesus to continue to press in this love. And so let me tell you, Northern Baptist Church, we got to continue to press. There's more work to be done. But I do know there is love for all the saints here. And I want you to be encouraged that way. But I'm also going to press you. Because clearly... Let's think about this for a moment. Paul says, because I've heard of your faith, right? Okay, so Paul is not in Ephesus, and he hears of the faith. He hears of the love of the church of Ephesus. So if Paul heard it, somebody had to speak it, right? Somebody had to say it, all right? And for somebody to testify, hey, I've seen the faith over at the church at Ephesus, and I've seen their love for all the saints, then somebody had to 
see it. Paul to hear it, somebody had to speak it, and that person had to see it, right? Which means there's activity going on here, right? There is activity going on here that is evidence of faith, that is evidence of love. There has to be. If there's not evidence, then Paul would have never heard it from anybody else. And back then, you can think about as, as Christians, Ephesus was a trade or port city, and so there'd be a lot of trading that would go on there. And so people would have to come into the city and get goods and then leave. But hotels like they have today were not probably places that Christians would want to spend a lot of time with in. It just was, could be nasty. And so the Christian would come to that city and look, where's the church at? And they find the church, and that church would take them in while they're there. Somebody would house them, and they'd feed them, and they'd share together what they had. That's beautiful, isn't it? And, and, and people probably came back to Paul, or when Paul came in and somebody said, Oh, I've been to Ephesus. I heard you were at Ephesus once. Boy, that church over there, they just love people. Man, I was loved while I was there. Their faith was so evident to me. And they bragged on the church in Ephesus, and Paul says, they're bragging on you. This is good. There's evidence. So therefore, there should be activity to this. I had Bill read James chapter 2, that portion. Verse 17 says, So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. What does a dead thing do? I'm moving more than dead thing is right there, right? I mean, they just... That's all dead things do. They do nothing. They have no power. Faith that does not work itself out in some action is dead faith. Here's the deal. When God blesses you with, with the spiritual blessings, when he blesses you with faith, it causes things to change in your life. It causes change in us. The result is always transformation. It always is. It causes faith in us. It's a live faith, right? Does God give dead faith? No, He gives live faith. So if God gives you live faith, it's going to work itself out in some type of action. John 13, 35, this is what Jesus said, By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Love works itself out in action. These people weren't just sitting around going, I've got a nice warm fuzzy inside towards those people. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean... If you, if, you, if you look at your neighbor this morning here in church, and you, say, and you think to yourself, I've got nice warm fuzzies towards them, but you never smile at them, you never greet them, you never say, how was your week this week? How can I pray for you this week? If you never do that, there's no evidence of love at all, is there? You might feel it inside, there might be a ushy gushy feeling, but if it doesn't come out, there's no expression of love. And, and, and here, there's obviously an expression of love. My wife and I, when we, we moved from Wisconsin to Minnesota, actually we still lived technically in Wisconsin for a while, but we were going to move to Minnesota. We moved to the border, rented an apartment until we could find a house. So here was our order of events. Now, I already had the job, so we moved up there. I was in sales at the time. Um, been in sales for a long time, so this is still new to me being a pastor. <laughs> but, uh, and so we moved there, and our goal was first we're going to find a church. And then, so we we're 20... Oh, we're 23. At first, we're going to find a church, and then we're going to move there. And that was the goal. Why? Because church is that important. It is that important. The family of God is that important. So we said, we'll find a good church. Because it didn't matter where we lived in the Twin Cities area. And the Twin Cities is a big area. <laughs> There's a lot of places, a lot of suburbs you could live, and you could drive an hour to get across it, you know. So we said, let's find out where a good church is. We'll move into that area. So we started visiting churches all around that section of Twin Cities. And uh, um, we went to one church, and we had our two-week-old, well, she was two weeks when we moved, but she's older. she was older than that by then, but maybe a month-old, six-weeks-old baby with us. So here's a young couple. I was young once, believe it or not. Here's a young couple, <laughs> and we're bringing in our car seat with the baby in it. Now, if that happened here, wouldn't all of you be like, Right? I mean, a little excitement, you know. And we were people who served. I mean, my plan was to get into a church and serve, and, to, and we're givers, you know. I mean, we we're going to be an active participant. So, but that's not stamped on my forehead, but that, 
That was our plan, whichever church we find. So we walked in, and we sat about in the middle on this side, and, and we sit down, and nobody says a word to us. And I, I, we think, looking back, we think something weird was going on in the church at the time, like they might have been going through a struggle. So I have a ton of grace for this church, but just, I'm just telling you our experience, okay? Um, we sat in the middle someplace. The church service got over. Everybody filed out. You know, here we are with this baby. You know, you think people would be, oh, no. Everybody walked past us. So we just got in the center aisle and walked out and strapped our daughter into the car. And we got in the car, and you know what we said to one another? I guess the search continues. <laughs> right? Why? There was no love for They weren't even interacting with each other. It's like there's no hope. <laughs> now, again, there may have been something blown up in that church in the last week that was very heavy. And we kind of guess maybe that was going on. So I have a ton of grace for them, but I didn't have enough grace to, at the time to give them another chance. But, uh, <laughs> but then a few weeks later, we end up at Chisago Lakes Baptist Church in Chisago City, Minnesota. And um, we walked in and, and we were greeted, you know, and people oohed and awed over Brianne. She used to be really cute until she got that red hair. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> love her to death. <laughs> But uh, everybody oohed and awed over Brianna and her big eyes, and, and then we sit down, and the service gets over, and I'll tell you, I don't remember what was preached, okay? Um, the service gets over. I just remember I didn't disagree with anything. And we get up to leave, and Don and Naomi, Felzine, walk up to us, and they say, hey, uh, what are you guys doing for lunch today? Well, just going back to the apartment, and well, come on over to our place. We got food, and... And so we went over to Don and Naomi's place for lunch, and we spent the entire afternoon there with a baby that had to take a nap, right? And, and we spent the entire afternoon there. We went back to Sunday evening church. They had 6 o'clock service there, so we went back. And when we got in the car to leave Sunday night, you know what we said? I think we found our church. Now, we didn't know. There were still some things to check out, right? I mean, it wasn't like automatic. Uh, suddenly, you know, next Sunday the snakes come out, and we're, oh, we're out of here, you know, but... <laughs> But, but we, we, we were pretty sure, right? And, and let, me, let me just say, I don't remember the sermon. I remember Pastor Schmidt, great guy. Um, I don't remember what he talked about. I remember the music was not what I preferred, but you know, none of that mattered. <laughs> I was loved. My family was loved. And, and the rest of it really didn't matter. You know, let me just share with you, church family, If someone comes to our church, visits, and they say, I don't like the fact that your pastor can't stand still, because I can't. <laughs> he makes me seasick, you know? <laughs> and, they, and they don't stay. My ego will be bruised, okay? But I will sleep well at night. If somebody says, you know, I can't agree on some doctrines, and so I can't stay, I, I won't lose any sleep over that. I think our doctrines are right out of the Word of God, and I, I hold to them. And I won't lose any sleep over that. If someone comes in and says, you know, I can't, stand, I can't stand the organ. I don't like this kind of traditional music. I will lose no sleep over it. If someone comes next Sunday and they hear my son play the drums, says, I can't stand that. And they say, I'm not staying. I won't lose a, a wink of sleep over that. That won't bother me a bit, okay? And I'm not going to change everything for everybody who walks through our doors. Not going to happen. But if someone comes in and visits with us and says, you know, that church is not friendly, they don't care for the body, they don't love people, I will lose a lot of sleep. It will drive me crazy. And I hope it would you too. Let us never have someone come into our midst that leaves and says they don't love people. And I, I mean, we have visitors here today. So you visitors, you're, you're hearing me preach to a congregation, you know, saying, you need to love the people who are here. And all the, all the new people are like, oh, no. <laughs> now everybody, nobody's going to let me out of the door on the way out, you know. <laughs> if somebody were to say to me, you guys are just a little too overwhelming. I wouldn't lose sleep over that. You know, if you guys are just a little too overwhelming, you love a little too much, somebody invited me over for dinner, that was weird, you know. <laughs> I will not lose sleep over that. Like, we just loved a little too much. Praise God for that, because we can't love enough. 
And I made a commitment out of our experiences that we experienced visiting churches. And we went back to Wisconsin. And, and when we moved back, it was a church we went to. We moved back to Wisconsin, went back to that church, okay? But in six years, a church can change a lot, okay? We've seen it change here in 10 months, you know? Six years, a church can change a lot. And so there were a lot of people I did not know. And so I had a, I had a job to do. I made a commitment. I'm going to get to know everybody here. I'm, I'm at least know their name, okay? So I, as, as I see somebody, I don't know if they've been there, you know, the entire six years that I left. I, I just knew they weren't there when I left, right? And so I walk up to somebody. I don't know if that was your first Sunday, but I walk up. And, Hi, my name's Sean, and, and I don't think we've met. And, and generally, they would be kind enough to give me their name. If I had to, I'd ask, you know, because sometimes it got that way, like, hmm, what's your name? <laughs> right? And, and so you, you, you're in the area, you live in the area, you know, I mean, just get to know them a little bit. And I did that with everybody that I didn't know over the first, I don't know, number of months I was there. And then when somebody new came in, guess what? I knew who they were. I knew everybody at church, and this church is 300 some people, so I mean, it's not a small church, but I, I knew everybody there. And so then when somebody new came in, it was like my, my laser sight was on them, right? Like, we've got to get to that one. <laughs> so I, didn't always, I wasn't always successful. Sometimes I, I tried to find them, and they, they disappeared. You know, pastor was praying to close service. I look up, they're gone, you know, and that happens sometimes here too. Uh, people, people don't want to stick around. They don't want to be uncomfortable. I get that. But I, was, I would rather them say I was a little uncomfortable when that guy introduced himself, that weirdo introduced himself to me. I was a little too uncomfortable, so I'm not coming back. I, I, I wouldn't lose sleep over that. But if somebody said, nobody talked to me, nobody said a word to me, they don't love there. That would drive me crazy, and I was not going to let that happen. And I was not a pastor. I was in sales. So lest you think, well, that's our pastor's job. Mm -mm. That's our job. That's our job. The church at Ephesus was loving all the saints. The church was. Not just the elders, not just the pastors. The church was doing it. It's our job. I had an email from a guy this week who's he's got a ministry, and it's, I mean, it's something you pay for if you want to get involved with it. But he sends emails out regularly, and I read his stuff because he's usually pretty good. And one of the things he stressed, he says, you're trying as a pastor, as a leader, to create owners in your church. Let me just share with you. If you hear me call this my church, I don't think I own it and, and run it in that sense. What I mean is this is where I belong. Does that make sense? This is, this is my church. You are my church. And I want you to look at me and say, you are my church, right? I want you to look at the others in here and say, this is my church. I was talking to a businessman today, or, uh, this week, I'm sorry, who uh, he owns a business. And, and I, I asked him, I said, so on Saturday, when nobody's scheduled to work, but there's a job that needs to get done, <laughs> Who comes in? Of course, he raises his hand. I'm the owner. I'm the one that comes in. Yeah, that's what we want here. When there's something that needs to get done, hey, it's my church. I got to get there, right? right. We, hey, that, that, that's my visitor, right? <laughs> I need to go introduce myself to him. This is my job. <coughs> Start owning the church, right? Start owning the church. Own this place. This is my church. I love my church. Do you love your church? I hope so. We're supposed to love all the saints. And we don't know who's coming in the door if they're a visitor, whether they're a saint or not, right? They might be a saint or an ain't, right? There's one or the other. They could be a saint. They might not be. But we love them. And if they're not, maybe get a chance to share the gospel with them, right? And if they are, you will have obeyed in loving one another. I had a conversation with a missionary this week, and I won't share his name because we're on Facebook. With just church family, I would, but I don't want to put this public, um, not because the missionary is in great shape. That's not, it's the story. I don't want to reveal the person that he was ministering to, but someone who is in a culture, in a family culture and religious culture, that if they become a Christian, they're going to lose everything. Now, the question that they asked in their letter, it wasn't really a question, but a statement that we can ask ourselves, is the gospel enough? Is the gospel enough? And because if this person comes to Jesus, they're going to lose their, their husband, they're going to lose their brothers and sisters, and their mom and their dad. Well, Jesus had something to say about that, didn't he? He said, if you're, not, if you're not willing to walk away from all of that, you're not worthy to be my disciple. And so this person has to walk away from that if they want to come to Jesus, and they have to be willing to say, I'll forsake it all. 
You're worth it, Jesus. Amen? And He is. But the gospel, where does it put us? In the church. Right? So the gospel is enough to bring them to salvation and then to bring them into the church. And so I asked this missionary, I said, so, because they're in the States. So I asked this missionary, I said, if, if this person said, I'm ready, I'm walking away from it all, do you have a church that you can call to say, hey, I've got a young lady, or maybe an older lady, I don't know, I don't know how old she was, who, who just walked, walked away from everything in their life, and they need a place to stay, they need a place to help get on their feet, they need a place to love on them, do you got a home that could take them in, this new saint? I said, do you have that? No, I don't. And I got tears in my eyes. Because the church is failing if that's the case. The gospel is enough. But, the, but Jesus is building his church to be the place where they get a family, right? This is where they become family in the church. So when they lose their family, he gives them so much better in the family of God. And then I had to ask myself, what if this missionary called me? And so I went home and we talked about it. My wife, I said, we've got a spare bedroom. Are we ready to take that young lady in and show love for all the saints? And I'll confess to you in that moment, I didn't have a solid answer to say, absolutely. And that's wrong. I need to be ready to say, yes, she's a saint. She needs a church. She needs a family. Yes, 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 a thousand times Yes. But we live convenient Christian lives. We love as long as it doesn't cost us anything, don't we? I mean, I'll write a check. That's easy, right? That cost me something, so I did write a check. But don't inconvenience me. Don't inconvenience my family. I tell, I, and I'm preaching to you as I preach to me, saying, what's wrong with you? Why is it an absolute... Absolutely. Now, I trust if that phone call ever comes, by the grace of God, I will say yes. But it will be by the grace of God because that's how I love. It's by His grace. But are we ready to love like that? I'm convinced the days are coming where that's going to be more and more and more. People are going to lose their jobs when they come to Christ. I believe that day is coming. Now, it may not come in my lifetime, but I believe the day is coming. And it may come sooner than we think. There's been a lot of changes that have happened in our world that, that have make me believe things are accelerating. Are we ready to love like that? Boy, that's a big call. That's a big ask. <laughs> we have a big Savior that gave us more than we ever could imagine. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. <clears throat> Is there anything that Jesus could ask of us that would be too much? That's why we must know, verses 3 through 14, that's why we spent so much time on that text of every spiritual blessing. Because all those spiritual blessings is enough for me to say, if this missionary calls me, says, I got a lady, I need a place to stay, she can stay with us. We'll take her in. And I'll talk to our church family and we'll figure out how we're going to rally around and, and see if we can't get her set up in an apartment someplace eventually and get her a job. And, and but she's got a family right here. Are we ready to do that? I hope so. I hope so, because I, and I know some of you are like, that'd be inconvenient. Yeah, I'm sure it was inconvenient for God to send his son and die on a cross. That was pretty inconvenient, and he gave his life for all of us. Did he? Don't inconvenience me, God. <laughs> I'm as convicted... <laughs> as I could be on this, if you, don't, if you can't tell. And it's a personal conviction, all right? God's still working on me on this. But I'm asking him, let's work on, let's work on us. Are we going to love this way? I think it's what we're called to. We need to love that way as we pray for one another. I mean, that's going to motivate our prayer for one another, isn't it? But we also need to approach the Lord with thankfulness. We come to him with thankful hearts. 
And, and Paul does that. Verse 16, I do not cease to give thanks for you. He, he is thankful without ceasing. He doesn't stop. What's that look like? <laughs> I mean, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank, no, that's not what it looks like, okay? <laughs> he just, every time he thinks of this church, he thinks, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your work in their lives, right? I thank you. I just, every time they come to mind, he's thankful. He's in a spirit, a heart of thankfulness. We always need to be in that spirit of heart for thankfulness, right? He's thankful for God's work upon the church, isn't he? He's thankful that God has blessed them with every spiritual blessing. He's thankful that God has done this on their behalf. So we can be thankful for God's work in us, right? But not only for the, the fact that God works, but he's thankful that he sees the results. He sees the evidence of his work in the church. And he's thankful. Now, remember, who's he thankful to? To God, right? He's not thanking the church at Ephesus for this. He's thanking God that God has done this in their lives. And he continues in thankfulness for the church at Ephesus. That, they, that there's evidence of their work. You see that when he hears of the, the work that has happened in their faith and the love that they've expressed. He's thankful for the church in and of itself. Let me ask this morning, are you thankful for your church? Are you thankful to be here this morning? Are you thankful? Thank, thank the Lord for that. Jesus Christ builds His church. So who, when we find a good church, which I'm telling you, and we're not a perfect church, don't get me wrong, but it is hard to find a good church. I don't know how many churches we went to, six, seven churches, something like that. And we were thankful we found one in six or seven, you know, when we lived in Minnesota. There's a lot of churches that just have lost their first love. The love in Jesus, the love for one another, or lost truth. By the way, I remember, maybe I shared this before, but I remember a friend of mine, he's a pastor in Australia, and I've never met him face to face. We just threw uh, classes online. And um, he challenged me one time as part of a church that I'm like, this church is truthful. They hold to the correct doctrines of the Word of God. But there's something off in what they're doing in these few situations that I'm aware of where, where there's, there, it's like they, they just ignore what they say they believe in, and I'm struggling with this. And, and, and he came back to me and he's like, I would rather... And don't hear this wrong, but he said, I would rather be in a church that loves and practices and has the fruit of the Spirit in it and maybe has some doctrines that are off than to be in a church that has every doctrine right, but it doesn't impact their very lives. And I'm like, that's a good point. Now, I would rather have both. Wouldn't you? <laughs> that's why I became a pastor. Now I have, no, I'm just kidding. But I'm not right on everything either. I mean, I'm sure, and, and people are going to come in here, and there's things we're going to disagree on, and that's okay. They can still be our brothers in Christ, and, you know, we'll have some disagreements at different points. But, but the reality is, is if doctrine doesn't impact our lives, it's of no good. It's of no good to know every theology, every doctrine, every truth from the Word of God, and hold to it tightly, but say, but I'm not going to let that impact me. Again, Jesus didn't say, they'll know you're my disciples by how much you know. Don't get me wrong, I will never tell you, I mean, we're going to get there in just the coming verses that says that you may be enlightened and be filled with the knowledge of God. And He does want you to have a knowing faith. He does want you to know doctrine. But not just so you can be the smart one in the room. But you should be, so you can be transformed by that doctrine, so it can inform everything you do, everything you say, everything you think. That's why. Doctrine is useful only when it's practiced, but not just by known, by being known. Thankful for your church. Thankful encouragement. He's encouraging them again, isn't he? He encourages them by telling them that their faith and their love, and he says, I don't... When somebody says, I thank God for you, what kind of encouragement is that to your heart? <laughs> Jim, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Somebody comes, I'm thankful to God for you. 
let me just encourage you this morning. I am thankful to God for you this morning. Because it would be very awkward to preach to an empty congregation, an empty auditorium every Sunday. So I'm thankful to God for you for that. And I'm thankful to God for you that you took a chance on a, on a guy who's never been a pastor before, you know, 18 months ago or so, and decided, you know what, we're going to call this guy into ministry because we believe God's hand is upon him. I'm thankful that you recognize that. I'm thankful that you moved me to Ohio, you know. I am so thankful for you because you in faith stepped out in those things. I'm thankful. I really am. I want you to know that. Be encouraged by that, that I'm thankful. But out of that thankful encouragement, I want to challenge us. I know I've already challenged you a little bit, but that was kind of things you've got to take steps towards, right? Those are things we've got to keep moving and pressing in this love. But here's a practical way that you can express thankful encouragement. And, and it's something God laid on my heart a couple of years ago, and, and I practiced it for a while, and I need to get back at it. Some of you are already doing this type of thing, and it's good, and I know that. Um, but I, I developed a habit for a while. It was really excellent, and I will tell you that I, let me tell you, this habit that I developed for a while, I, that I quit and I need to get back on, I still get fruit from that habit, from what I implemented. Like this week, I got two texts from a friend of mine, some scripture. The guy never texts me anything personal. He always texts me like a scripture reference or a sermon, you know. <laughs> But you know what? That's probably more valuable than, than the personal notes he could send me, you know, because he's trying to exhort me into truth. But I still get that fruit out of what I did a couple years ago. So let me just tell you, God will bless what, if you take this on. First of all, thank God for five saints this week. Thank God for five saints this week, okay? Five saints. There's some in this room, okay, if you're looking for who I can thank God for. But it doesn't have to be somebody in the church. I mean, in the church as a whole, but it doesn't have to be somebody from this church. But just five saints, five sisters or brothers in Christ, so you're like, turn your sheet over, get a pencil out, and write down the five names, okay? I'm going to thank God for these people. These are people I'm thankful for. And then go to God and say, thank you. God, thank you for placing this individual in my life. Okay? I'm going to tell you, don't write my name down. I don't know if anybody would have, but don't write my name down. Okay? Write another name. I have five names. Okay? Because I don't want you to do this to me. I want this to spread. Okay? Five names. And then I want you to, after you, after you thank God for them, do it. Okay? And try to do so daily. But if you, you know, just thank God for them. Then I want you to get in touch with them. And say, so I want you to know I'm thanking God for you. And you know, the easiest way to do that, if you have a cell phone and they have a cell phone, is text, right? I mean, done. <laughs> that's how I, that's what I did. I texted. And I would thank God almost every day for a few people, and I would text those people. And I mean, it wasn't five. I, there was probably 30 or 40 guys, because I usually don't do that for ladies, so I'll do that for men. But I texted them. There's one guy who still gets in touch with me, but I will tell you, almost, almost everyone was very, very thankful because they needed the encouragement. Let me ask you, if you got out of church this morning and this evening you're getting ready for bed and all of a sudden your phone went off, ding, and you go and look at it and, hey, I just wanted you to know I'm thanking the Lord for you right now. What would that do for you? You might sleep soundly, <laughs> right? Somebody's thinking of me and praying for me. But those phones don't go ding unless somebody's on the other end sending the text, right? Somebody's got to take the initiative. And it might even prompt you the next morning because maybe it's getting late, or maybe you do engage them right then. And say, I'm so thankful for you too. And then their phone goes, ding, right? <laughs> and, and, oh, do you see how this can spread? It can spread. And, and, the, and out of those five people, let's say one of them asks, you know, where'd this come from? And don't tell them it came from a sermon necessarily, okay? But tell them I was challenged. I just challenged, because if you're challenged, it's challenged by the Lord. It's not by me, okay? That's the Holy Spirit. Some of you aren't going to do this. I don't, I don't worry about that, because if the Holy Spirit's not challenging you to do this, he's probably challenging you to do something else. So go do that, all right? But if he's challenging you to do this, it's going to be the Holy Spirit that's driving you to do this, all right? And you're going to engage and maybe the Holy Spirit will take that challenge you pass on to somebody else, and they'll do five people, right? 
and be like, that's pretty cool. I'm going to do that too. You know, and maybe one of the five does that and, and one of their five does that. And do you see how this could just pretty soon everybody in Norton and Copley and, and Barberton and Wadsworth and Akron is getting texts all over the place and being thanked. Every Christian is all of a sudden being thanked for, right? And everybody's going, I'm fired up by this. We could do this. We could do this if you take this on. You say, I'm not doing five. I'll do 10. <laughs> Good. We need this type of encouragement. We need to show love to all the saints. And this is one way we can begin to show love to all the saints here and build that relationship with one another. And maybe one of your five, make it someone that you don't always connect with. One that, you know, they've ministered to you somehow, but you just never really connected with them. But you're like, I go to church with that person, or I know that person pretty well. We interact frequently. They go to another church, but we interact frequently. I just, I just need to let them know. They've ministered to me. And let's just see what God would do out of that. So that's my challenge. I don't do that every week, but I'm going to do that this week. Just, just go do it. And you know what's cool about this? is it, 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 You know how long this would take you? You know, this homework assignment, if we call it that. You know how long it would take you? It could take you less than 10 minutes. You could have it done before the end of the day. I promise you, you could. You could have it done and just, you know, eat lunch today. I'm going to just do this. I'm going to thank the Lord as I pray, and then I'm going to... You say, well, that sounds too trite. It won't be trite to the one you text. It won't be trite. If you thought about somebody and prayed for them, it will not be trite to them. It'll be meaningful to them. Go love. Amen? Let's love. Father, I just thank you so much for teaching us how we can come to you and making a way through Jesus Christ to give us the grace to even come to you right now. It's amazing that we can be before your throne of grace, finding grace and mercy in time of need, Father. And if we would be honest with each other and with you right now, we are always in a state of need. Father, you know the needs of every person here. Uh, better than they know them themselves. And Father, even as I've issued this challenge, I recognize you may challenge a number of people in a totally different direction. I would rather they pursue that because you know better. <laughs> that's, that's how you answer prayer. That's how you respond. Father, let us be thankful this week for those you put in our lives who you've given those spiritual blessings to, those who may have mentored us, those who you may have brought to us to minister to. Let us just be found faithful, faithful to Jesus Christ in loving one another this week. And in all the areas, you know what our week looks like. And Father, I trust that you're going to use whatever we do out of this to glorify your great name, to glorify the great name of Jesus Christ through your wonderful, powerful Holy Spirit in our lives. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.